Thank you, choir. Dan, instrumentalist, thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. Hope everybody's having a great morning. I can't think of a better way to start a worship service than with a baptism. And uh, we can fill that thing up as many times as we need to. We, we have a few members on the city council that have a little bit of influence with the water company, so if we run up a big bill, we're, we're not going to worry too much about it. Well, we've been talking the past few weeks about discipleship, and we've been talking about how it is the um, commission of the church to make disciples, all the way from... Um, bringing the gospel message to those dead in their trespasses and sin, to maturing them to the point where they can make disciples themselves. We've been talking about that commission. We've been talking about it in terms of us being ready for that job through what, uh, what I've been calling, anyway, training camp. It's that time of year when uh, most people in Tennessee's mind turns to football. If you're not a football fan... Uh, I apologize, uh, some of you aren't, but bear with me. It's a great example, and we've been talking about basic training, we've been talking about strength drills, that sort of thing. Well, today, I want to take us to a little bit different aspect of training camp, and that is where we prepare ourselves to defend our faith and to defend ourselves and to defend our church from attacks. And uh, we're going to be reading in the sixth book, excuse me, the sixth chapter of the book of Acts this morning, the first seven verses. Um, but before we do, let me catch you up a little bit with what's been going on in the early church. See, the early church was very close to the commission that was given to them by Jesus. They were very, uh, this was something very real to them. The leaders of the church were men who had walked with Jesus, who had seen his miracles, who had been with him. So we want to look to this early church as an example of how we ourselves should live and as a church may be a pattern for us to follow as we go forward. And in that early church in the, uh, in the fourth chapter of Acts, we see where the apostles were so bold in their statements and so bold in their preaching that they'd been arrested and brought before the Sanhedrin. They'd been given a stern talking to and turned loose. Well, that didn't do anything but encourage them, and they preached more. So we see in Acts chapter 5 that they were arrested yet again. And this time they were imprisoned. They were miraculously loosed from prison by angels and were found in the court of the temple preaching yet again. So they got arrested again, and this time they got flogged. But being who they were, they just said to themselves and said to everybody, praise God that we would be accounted worthy to suffer for Jesus in this manner. So that kind of brings us to where we are today. The apostles have been in and out of jail. They continue to preach. And I'm going to read this passage rather than all at once. I'm going to read it verse at a time and unpack it because there's a lot of stuff here stuff that's a theological term okay there's a lot of stuff here that I'd like for us to pay attention to this morning so let's start in with verse 1 Acts chapter 6 verse 1 I'm reading from the New American Standard Version now at this time while the disciples were increasing in number a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food now at this time, we're not given a specific time frame, but we know that this is very early in the life of the church. This is at the very beginning. They're still in Jerusalem. Stephen is still alive. Paul's not come on to the scene yet. So this is very early in the life of this church. It's in Jerusalem. We see from what Scripture tells us that every time the church is, um, is dealt with, Every time something happens to the church, they continue to grow. Now this next phrase, uh, in fact, it's just uh, well, this next phrase. While the disciples were increasing in number. Let me stop here for a minute. While the disciples were increasing in number. That's basically the story of the early church. From the day of Pentecost forward, they kept increasing and increasing and increasing. 
This did not make Satan happy. You all understand that, do you not? That any time a church is witnessing to the community, disciples are, making, are being made, the church is acting in unity, this upsets Satan tremendously. So while this was going on, even before things began to look the way they were looking, Satan was at work, was he not? We already know that they'd been arrested and thrown in jail, so he was attacking them from without. I mean, that's a fairly easy thing to notice when the authorities come and arrest your leadership, is it not? I mean, that's pretty, pretty obvious. So they knew that Satan was after him there. But then there's an account uh, in the uh, fifth chapter of a supposed couple, or excuse me, a couple who were supposed members of their church who let greed and jealousy and a few other things impact their life. We're talking about Ananias and Sapphira. You all know the story there. In the fourth chapter, there's an account of where a man by the name of Levi, that we know better as Barnabas, sold a piece of property and gave the money to the disciples to use as they needed in the church. Well, Ananias and Sapphira became jealous of the attention that he got. They wanted some of that attention. So they sold a piece of property, and they only brought part of the money to the apostles' feet, which was fine. It was theirs to do with. But what did they do that was so wrong? Do you recall what they did? They lied. They said that's 100% of what we got out of that piece of property. And as a result, the Holy Spirit took their lives. So again, Satan is attacking the church. He's attacking from without. He's attacking from within. So that's why when we see this phrase here, while the disciples were increasing in number, it is a reminder to us that while we may think things are good and while we may be stirring the waters of baptism on a regular basis and while we see people coming to hear the message and while we're taking the message out to people, this does not make Satan happy. And even while this is happening, he is on the attack. So while the disciples were increasing in number, now here's a favorite, this is one of the favorite phrases that pastors hear. A complaint arose. A complaint arose. Now, I'm going to come back to that, but I'm going to read the rest of that phrase. A complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews. Okay, now, let's talk a minute about who these two groups were as they're identified here. The Hellenists were not necessarily people from the Greek isthmus. They are, they are the, the Greek peninsula. Sorry, I've got my geography wrong. The Greek peninsula. Uh, about 300, 350 years before this account, Alexander conquered most of the known world. And as a result, Greek culture spread all around the Mediterranean as far as India, uh, up into uh, toward the steppes of Russia, part of Europe, northern Africa. So the impact of Alexander the Great and this Hellenistic culture was much greater than just what we kind of view today as the country of Greece, okay? So when we talk about Hellenistic Jews, it doesn't necessarily mean people from Greece. It means widows from all of these other places where Hellenism had influence. And you say, well, why were there so many of these Hellenistic widows in Jerusalem? Well, recall... Last week, we, uh, the, the passage we looked at was built around something called the Day of Pentecost or the Feast of Pentecost. It was one of the three feasts uh, in the Jewish faith that was a pilgrimage feast. People were expected to come from all over during Passover, during the Feast of Weeks or the Feast of Pentecost, and then the Feast of Booths later on in the fall. So you constantly had people from other parts of the world coming in here. Secondly, there was nothing any greater or any better for somebody to aspire to do in that time but to go and live in Jerusalem, especially if you were an older person. This was the center of your faith. This is where the sacrifice took place. This was where the center of your religious life was, so it was an aspiration for some of these older people to move to Jerusalem and live. You might, you might think of it as Florida today, okay? But it was, it was focused on their faith. So you had all these widows that were not Hebraic Jews. 
Jews that were native to Jerusalem. Okay? So immediately here we begin to see the root of the problem. Because this next phrase says, because their widows. Now I'm going to stop and talk about two things. A complaint arose, their widows. Do you see what Satan's doing here? Do you see what Satan's doing? They were dividing up in factions. Our widows, their widows. Our group, their group. My class, their class. Do you see what was going on? Rather than being unified, they were beginning to divide up in little groups. Satan was whispering in their ear, saying, you have more in common with this person, so therefore you need to associate with them, and, and you're more like this person. You know, those Hellenistic Jews, they're not from around here. Any of you ever heard that before? Everywhere I go, I hear that. He's not from around here. Anyway, uh, people don't know whether I'm from Illinois or from Tennessee. When I'm up there, I'm from here. When I'm here, I'm from up there. It's all right. But you see what happened. They divided into factions, into factions. And then, even more insidious, in Matthew chapter 18, Jesus told his disciples, if there's something between you and another disciple, go to him and talk about it. Don't go talk to somebody, not, I'm paraphrasing here, but the implication is don't go talk to somebody else about it. Don't start choosing up a team. Don't speculate. Don't assume that you know what the other person meant when they said something that bothered you. Go talk to them. You see, a complaint arose. And you know that this is the case when you look at the way that Dr. Luke constructed this. See, there's two words in the Greek that you can use to indicate opposition. One is A-N-T-E, ante, which means face-to-face. -face. Okay? If you have something, if I have something against uh, uh, Jonathan and I want to talk to him face-to-face, -face, it's ante. But if I've got something against Dan and I go up here to, to Alan and say, Alan, Phil, did you hear what Dan did? Can you believe what he did? That's the word that's used here, pros, which implies a secondary confrontation. You see what was happening? They were overlooking the commands of Jesus Christ, and they began to talk behind each other's back. And they began to say, can you believe that, Pastor? Can you believe what he did? I can't imagine what he's thinking. You know that's right? I can't imagine what any single one of you are thinking right now. Okay? So if I have a question, what should I do? Ask. See, that is Satan's device here, is to divide the people into groups and divide them into different factions and to get them to talking about each other rather than follow Jesus' simple command, which says, if you got something against a brother, talk to him about it. That goes, lady, too. Okay, And that implies an obligation on the part of both the person going with an issue and the person hearing it. Any of you kind of, the expression is kind of get up on your back legs when somebody comes to you and says, I need to talk to you about something. Do we immediately go on the defensive? Yeah. Why is that? Well, maybe it's because, <laughs> maybe it's because we got something to be defensive about. Okay, We shouldn't be that way. If a brother or sister comes and says, I need to talk to you about something then your obligation is to say, let's talk about it. Let's work this out. Because you see, that formula in Matthew 18, take it to the brother. If, if you and your brother can't resolve it, take somebody from the church with you and then resolve it. If you can't do that, take them before the church. 99% of issues should be solved. Brother to brother, sister to sister, sister to brother. It should never get that far. But that's what Satan was doing. He said, I can't arrest them and get them to shut up. And I can't send somebody in like Ananias and Sapphira and mess them up. So now I'm going to divide them up. Okay? So here's where it was. They were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. We really don't know if that's actually the case or not. We don't know what the root of this was. The issue is a complaint arose. So let's see what happened next. 
Okay? Now, y- you all understand, don't you, that, that when somebody comes to you and says, well, I can't believe, I can't believe what somebody said, and you sit there and not. Do you know what you've become? Not only have you become a party to it, you're engaging in something that's called gossip. Now, what? Seriously, you are. I mean, and do you know how seriously God takes gossip? Let, let me read a passage to you. You know, we hear about gossip and we kind of pass that over. Listen to this. This is found in Romans chapter 1, verses 28 and 29. He said, and just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper. Now, I'm not saying that if somebody engages in gossip, God's giving them over to a depraved mind. I want you to see how God classifies gossip. Gave them over to a depraved mind to do things which are not proper, being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossips. That's how he sums up that whole passage. That's a pretty ringing indictment, is it not? So, Satan says, I can't get them one way, I'm going to get them another, here's how I'm going to do it. Well, let's see how the apostles went about defending this attack. Again, from the standpoint, thinking of defense, let's look at verses 2, 3, 4, and 5. Okay? So I'm going to read this a little bit at a time. So the twelve summoned the congregation of disciples. Now we know from other passages in uh, Acts chapter 4 and chapter 5, by this time the church was very likely somewhere between 20 to 30,000 people, even more. There was no one place in Jerusalem that 20,000 people, much less 30, could be at one time. So when it says summon the congregation of disciples, very clearly, there had to be some representation there. Not everybody could get all in one place at one time. But the point of it is, everybody was fairly represented. And said, it is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Please understand, the disciples were not saying we're so important we can't help distribute the food. But think for a minute. How many apostles were there at this point? I'd hold up 12 fingers, but only got 10. So there were 12. Okay, 12 apostles. How many people were there? 20 to 30,000. How many widows were there? We, we don't know that, but in that population, there were probably two to 3,000 widows. I think that would be a fair estimation. The apostles were at a point of saying, look, we've got a choice to make. We can either continue to minister the word, to pray, and to teach, or we're going to have to turn to all these administrative tasks and do that. And we think, as apostles, that it's better for us to minister to the word. We don't have, it's not proper for us to wait tables. And understand, too, when they say wait tables, they're not talking about bussing tables and serving food. Simply that. That word tables is the same word that's used, uh, if you recall the account where Jesus went into the temple and turned the money changers' tables over. It's that same word. There's a connotation there of financial obligation. So what they were saying, it's not just, you know, waiting tables, but this whole issue of collecting money and distributing and buying food and getting it out there and all this sort of thing. They're saying we've come to a point where we can't do both. And we think it's important for us to continue our ministry in the Word. Okay? Um, Folks, I would not ever compare myself to one of these men. But my first obligation to you is to be in the Word and to pray for you guys. To pray for you and to be in the Word and to prepare the Word for the times that we have together. Now, if I take care of that and I have time to do other things as well, that's part of my obligation too, but my first priority is to God's Word. If I made other things my first priority, you would know it, and you would suffer, and I would suffer. So the disciples are saying very clearly there has to be a division of work here. So they say, Therefore, brothers, select from among you seven men of good reputation, 
full of the spirit and of wisdom, who we may put in charge of this task. Okay? Seven. Now let's stop and think about that a minute. Seven men to do this task. How many people were there all together, did we say? 20, 30,000? Is seven enough really to take care of all those issues? I don't think so. So we have to understand that there was already an organization kind of ongoing in this church. There already had to be a structure, okay? They'd run into a specific special problem caused by Satan. See, that's the point. Satan caused them a problem that was beyond what they already had set up. Think of it, you ever watch well, Peyton Manning? You all know who Peyton Manning is? Anybody here know Peyton Manning? You know, when he's on offense, what's that word he uses when he's under center and he sees the defensive lineup and he wants to change the offensive plan? What's that word he uses? Omaha. Omaha. Okay. It's the worst kept secret around, okay? Well, what a lot of people don't realize is defenses do that too. When the defensive set gets up there and the, the, the defensive captain sees the formation that the defense is in, sometimes they'll call an audible on defense. That's what the disciples were doing here. They had something set up. It wasn't working real good. Satan comes in, causes the problem. The apostles are essentially calling an audible here. Said, we've got a problem. We've got to deal with it. We've got to defend the church, the integrity of the church, the heart of the church against Satan's attack. So here's what we're going to do. Select seven men. Good reputation. Full of the Spirit. Full of wisdom. Okay? Some qualifications there. The first one seems obvious. Select from among you. What does that imply? Just obviously? They had to be believers. They had to be saved believers. So the first qualification here is you have to be a saved believer. Second one says you need to be of what? Good reputation. Now I think we all know what a good reputation is. That's when they say, do you know so and so? Yeah, I know him. What kind of a guy is he? Well, you know, he's a, he's a stand-up guy. Never known him to do anything wrong. People know who you are by your actions. They know who you are. They know what your reputation is. So that's fairly obvious. What about full of the Spirit? What is somebody that's full of the Spirit? Maybe somebody who pays attention to their Scripture reading and their prayer. When you talk to them, you can hear the love of Christ in their voice. You can see that they're gentle in nature and loving in heart. They're full of the Spirit. Also a qualification is that they're wise. What is wisdom? What is wisdom? I think of wisdom as the application of the hard lessons I've learned in life through the lens of the Scripture. Anybody ever made a mistake, made a bad decision? Not like, you don't have to show me your hands, okay? Here's wisdom, or here's the lack of wisdom. Lack of wisdom is you go, doing this, you go do the same thing again expecting a different outcome. Wisdom says, I tried it that way. It didn't work. I've learned from that. I'm going to do it a little bit differently this time. That's wisdom. So the disciples are saying, don't just go pick anybody. Pick these types of individuals. Okay? So, and we will put them in charge of the task. And we will devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. The statement found approval with the whole congregation. In other words, they put this before the, the representative congregation. People listened said, this sounds like a plan. We've got to defeat Satan. This sounds like a plan. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. Now, when you look at these names, and when you take into account there was only seven of them, and when you see the disciples kind of calling this audible, a lot of times this passage is pointed to as the appointment of the first deacons. And it very well may have been, but we don't really see that term used in the Greek as a noun or as an office here. And there's some other things that lead us to believe that while these guys may have been deacons, Every one of those names that I just read have, a, have an origin in Greece. They are Greeks. Even that last, why would you point out that Nicholas was a proselyte to the Jewish faith before he became a Christian? Where had the problem arisen? With the Hellenists. So I think the Holy Spirit through the people showed wisdom in choosing some of the Hellenistic believers to solve a Hellenistic problem. Okay? Now, they very well may have been deacons, 
But we don't know that strictly from this passage. Clearly, the qualifications are valid. And when you look at 1 Timothy chapter 3 and the qualifications he puts out for the office of deacon, you see these same characteristics echoed there. But primarily, they were there to take care of a specific problem. Okay, So, let's see how that turned out. Okay? Um, we look at verses 6 and 7. They set these guys out. They would do their job. And do we hear about this ever again? Don't hear about it in Scripture again, so we have to assume the problem was taken care of. I think we can infer correctly from that, in that, in verses 6 and 7, it says, after naming these guys, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them, and the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. So what we see here is yet again an attack by Satan, the apostles listening to the Holy Spirit, putting together a team, special teams, if you will, to take care of this defense. Maybe it was a, you know, a third and long passing prevent defense. Okay, Think of it however you will. But they put together this specific team of men to take care of a problem, specific qualifications, and we see here, we see what happened. And the word of God increased and the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. So why do we talk about this? Because church, as individuals, when we try to follow Christ as our Savior, when we try to follow His commands, when we try to make ourselves like Him, Satan is not pleased. When we're in school, and some, probably those of you in high school, when I start talking about gossip, that's a new word for you, okay? Never heard that. But let me tell you, those kids in high school know who you are. Oh, I know that family. I know that, that, that girl. I know that boy. They go to First Baptist. Where you work, people know where you go to church. Where you go out places, people know who you are. And you know what people who are lost are doing? They are watching you. And they are looking to see whether you're living out the commands of Christ. And isn't it just like Satan to try to mess that up big time? So that's what was going on here. As a church, we're going to try to be making disciples. Y'all have been making disciples. This church has been here for nearly 150 years making disciples. And it has withstood attack after attack after attack. And I don't even know the specifics of them. I know you've withstood them or you wouldn't be here. But nothing would please Satan any more than for us to get fussing and feuding with each other. For a complaint to arise as a result of gossip, not trusting one another, not loving each other enough to talk to each other about what's on our hearts and on our minds. That's what he would like to see happen. He wants to destroy our witness. He does not want us to get the ball across the goal line. He does not want to see a single new disciple made in Dunlap in the Sequatchie County. That's why this is important. Look at what the disciples did. They were attentive. They put together a plan. They had spiritual qualifications. And the Lord blessed their efforts. Now individually this morning, I don't know where you are. You could be listening to this this morning and saying, I have no idea when he talks about a believer. I have no idea when he talks about witness somewhere. I have no idea what he's talking about. Maybe you have never repented of your sins. Maybe you have never taken that step to say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I recognize that I'm a sinner. And I realize that I cannot, on my own, justify myself before holy God. But Lord Jesus, would you do that for me? I repent of my sins. I confess them to you. I'm going to turn from that life. I'm going to follow you. Maybe you've never done that. This morning would be a great time. There are a number of deacons here this morning. I'll be down here in the front. Come talk to us. We'd love to work with you and pray with you through that. Maybe you've done that, but for whatever reason, you've never followed Jesus and believers' baptism. You saw it this morning. It's survivable, isn't it, Nancy? You made it through it. Okay. We've not drowned but one or two, Dan, have we? 
No. No, I don't know that that's happened to anybody. The point of it is, baptism is not necessary for salvation, but it is necessary if you're going to tell the world, I'm a follower of Christ, and Jesus wants us to do that. So for whatever reason you've never been baptized this morning and you want to talk about that, you come and talk to one of us. Come and talk to me. If you're here this morning and you're between churches, you've moved, or for whatever reason you believe that this is where God wants you to invest your life and be a part of this team as we evangelize and disciple Dunlap and this valley, this church is open for new members. We'd love to have you. So I don't know what your issue is this morning. I don't know what the Holy Spirit may have laid on your heart. I will tell you one last thing. Satan's greatest weapon for you as you sit here right now, this moment, this morning, is to whisper in your ear, do it next week. Don't do it now. There's too many people here. Somebody will see you. Yeah, okay, you, you, you need to do something, but do it next week. Don't do it now. And here's the thing. If you listen to Satan today, it'll be easier to listen to him next week and the week after that and the week after that. There's no time like the present. If the Holy Spirit's dealing with you this morning, deal with it this morning. Satan does not want you to be successful. You have to defend against his attacks. As a church, we have to as well. This morning, as we stand together, and as I pray and the musicians prepare themselves, the Holy Spirit has been speaking to you. Now's the time to do something about it. Heavenly Father.